we're re-examining carefully our trade strategy with respect to China. In defeat, I cannot help but feel a kind of hope. We have to consider all the difficulties of everyday lives and respond effectively to the anger that has been expressed. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, Early Edition, with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Paris. Here's what's coming up on today's program. China's COVID outbreak spreads. Beijing orders mandatory testing, sparking fears of an unprecedented lockdown of the capital. Macron's encore, while the French president defeats right-wing challenger Marine Le Pen to secure another five-year term. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin pledge more aid on a visit to Kiev. U.S. officials promise more than $700 million in financial assistance. So first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. My colleague and Markets Live editor Mark Cudmore is in Singapore for us. Busy day on the markets, Mark. Let me just go through the main moves. It's very clear that stocks and commodities are tumbling quite significantly. Risk-off mood because of uh, the bigger slowdown that they worry about in China due to possible lockdowns. Why is the market sitting up and taking notice now instead of doing it two weeks ago, Mark? That's a great question, Fran. As you say, it is certainly a busy day in markets. Why are they reacting now? They certainly are reacting now. I think part of it was that we knew that there was going to be China COVID problems all this year. The zero COVID policy did not seem to make sense with the contagiousness of Omicron. But Shenzhen outbreak was handled very well. That provided some complacency that maybe China could get away with this. Now, suddenly, in the wake of the problems around Shanghai and suddenly the news is spreading to Beijing, the concern is really, really amplified because we've delayed it for so long. And you're seeing that across markets. You're seeing a real classic risk aversion today. And I emphasize the fact that it's classic risk aversion because obviously the last few months we've seen volatile markets, we've seen risk aversion, but it's not been your classic risk aversion because your havens like treasuries and the yen have really, really suffered. But today it really is just classic risk aversion. We are seeing red right down the equities column. And note, it is those commodities equities that are really getting suffering the most. And we're seeing that in the FX world as well. One of the biggest movers is the offshore yuan. It is selling off the most since the August 2015 mini deval by the PBR and that is spreading across currencies and that is also concerning markets further because it means that if the yuan is weakening then the PBOC can't afford to bring in the easing that many people have expected because they don't want to widen the rate differentials even further with the dollar and therefore that's kind of weighing on equities even further because they won't deliver the easing and as I said we're seeing classic risk aversion generally we're seeing yields lower bonds higher on the day and of course because China is suffering because they might be slowing down growth there's a chance that, you know, the commodities are going to really get smacked and see lower demands. So we're seeing oil lower yeah. and metals lower across the board. So, Mark, first of all, how much weaker can the yuan actually get? And what is the market really worried about? That this has a global repercussion because it just because it's on the commodity complex that people stop buying and stop building? Or is it, you know, something deeper with second and third round effects? It's both the, the first round effects and the second round effects. So China is the biggest consumer of commodities in the world, so that's one big issue. But then there's the secondary impact that if the yuan is losing value, then it lowers the purchasing power value, uh, ability of China to buy those commodities. And of course, there is the fact that just China is locking down. This just means it's the growth of not only the world's biggest consumer of commodities, but the world's second largest economy. And that has neck on growth effects to other commodities. So this is why commodities are getting absolutely smacked today. This is a chart of dollar yuan over the past six months and you can see many people thought the yuan was due a little bit of weakness but this move has catch bill so much offside because it has been so violent so rapid and in the wake of such stability seen over the last six or seven months this is already the largest five-day move seen since as I said since the deval 2015 it's caught people completely offside but if you want to finish with one bit of positive news I think the scale of this move means that the PBOC will have to come in tomorrow, provide a little bit more stability for the currency, mm -hmm. and that might provide a bit of relief across other assets as well. Yeah, and that would be a bit of a divergence play. So China has ordered mandatory COVID tests in the district of Beijing and locked down some areas of the capital as policymakers race to prevent a repeat of the outbreak that's hobbled Shanghai for weeks. So we'll have plenty more, of course, on this throughout the day. Thank you so much for that, Mark Cudmore. Now joining us is also Asian health reporter Michelle Cortez. Michelle, worrying signs out of Beijing. Bring us up to date with the latest. 
so the numbers of infections in Beijing is still relatively low. Of course, the concern is, is that officials there are saying that it's stealthy and that it is appearing to be a bit more widespread than we had originally realized. Now, that's exactly what happened in Shanghai. Even though the numbers were low, we were getting some worrisome commentary from officials there, and that's what led to aggressive action. That's what we think that we're seeing in Beijing. We are now starting to see some mass testing happening in, in certain regions, and they are locking down certain apartment complexes, and that is the sort of thing that can continue to spiral on and on. Now, it was just referenced that Shen Zen did a particularly effective job at getting its coronavirus outbreak, its Omicron infection, under control. And what they did is they acted very, very quickly and, and, and efficiently, locking everything down and only had to do it for one week. In Shanghai, it was much more iterative. They started slowly and then just kept expanding, expanding. So it'll be interesting to see what Beijing elects to do. Yep. Oh, yeah, the, the pain threshold, of course, something we look at very closely. Michelle, thanks so much. Michelle Cortez there, a Bloomberg Health Reporter. Now, joining us to talk about these markets, Virginie Maisonneuve. She's Global Equity Chief Investment Officer at Allianz Global Investors. Virginie, I want to talk about the French election, but first of all, on these markets, are they overreacting to news of China, or was it a long due correction? I think it's a risk of moment. You've had uh, clearly, you know, some changes in the bond market in the U.S. Uh, central banks are hawkish. We have 11 trillion uh, dollars worth of global debt that have moved into from negative yield to positive yield territory. And now, of course, so you have the inflation side and you have the demand side. And China is an important part of the global demand side. Uh, so I think this is what's happening. Now, clearly, China uh, can deal with this situation. And it's uh, but the, the markets are concerned. The markets are concerned, Virginie. What's the next point of concern going to be? If PBOC actually acts tomorrow, will that give a little bit of relief to global markets, or could this get worse as we look at to what the Fed can do to tame inflation? Well, so I, I think it's it's possible that China decides that the renminbi can go weaker until this COVID situation is uh, is under control in uh, in Beijing, right? Uh, and in terms of support, remember China is a different at a different stage than the U.S. The economy is quite weak, while the U.S. economy is quite strong. And so raising rates, for example, or you know, is is not in the cards. It's about supporting the economy to grow through this next quarter. So so that with the, by the third quarter, the economy is in a better shape. So we'll see what PBOC uh, can do, but I think they'll let the currency be a bit weaker. Uh, Virginie, we also saw that Emmanuel Macron win last night with 58 percent of the vote. Then we look at the legislative, the parliamentary elections in June. Why is the market largely ignoring this? Well, I think it's it's in, in risk of environment. Uh, bad news get priced very badly, and good news are sort of uh, ignored. It's like check on the list and move on. Uh, it is important, uh, you know, the Macron vote is a vote for Europe and for NATO in this very volatile and difficult environment. Uh, but I think this is what's happening. It's being ignored because it's good news. Do you worry, Virginie, that we're going to see some kind of paralysis in political France, which would lead to less reforms, but also more voters getting angry the next time around if they're not taken care of? The, 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 definitely. The, the challenges and, and this election was really not clearly he won, but with a lower uh, threshold. And when you see the amount of uh, discontent, it, it is really challenges. Those are reflecting challenges that need to be addressed. Uh, connection uh, with people. Macron is seen as somebody who can connect with all the population. This needs to improve. The other thing is who will the prime minister be so that he gets uh, his majority in assembly? And that's going to be the key thing uh, in the next few weeks. Virginie, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Virginie Maisonneuve, their Global Equity Chief Investment Officer at Allianz Global Investors. Now, we're also getting some breaking news out of IFO. That German number just crossing the Bloomberg terminal, April German Business Confident Index is actually rising at 91.8 percent. It's a little bit better than expected. Uh, economists had estimated an 89 figure. Coming up. Encore, Emmanuel Macron clinches a second term as French president. We get all of the latest from Paris. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Paris. Now we'll have, of course, a full roundup of the markets. Also, Emmanuel Macron defeating Marine Le Pen in France's presidential election on a pro-business, pro-EU platform. Macron took more than 58% of the vote, making him the first incumbent in two decades to win a second term. Now, in his victory speech, he thanked French voters for rallying around him. This day of the 24th of April 2022, a majority among us made the choice to entrust in me the presidency of our republic for the five years to come. In defeat, I cannot help but feel a kind of hope. For our French and European leaders, this result is evidence that cannot be ignored of how the French people greatly distrust them and a broad aspiration for change. Well, joining us is Pierre Carleskind. He is a member of the European Parliament for Macron's party, La République en Marche. Pierre, thank you so much for joining us. I guess effusion, nebulation, a lot of happiness out there. But this was a different President Macron yesterday. He yes. was much more toned down. The victory speech only lasted 10 minutes. How does he refocus and regroup today? Yeah, that's uh, first a relief, a relief uh, for all people believing in uh, democracy. Uh, in freedom and uh, in the fact that uh, the far right can't go to power in France. Uh, for now? For now, well, for now, of course, we have this uh, general election, the legislative elections, as we say in, in good French. Um, we have now to be sure that democracy will prevail in France. Uh, but look at the first round of the elections. The, 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 the situation is quite clear. The far right is not the leading movement in France. So, but, yeah, it could be the biggest opposition. I mean, I'm looking at, and you see it in the charts. I mean, it, it just keeps on rising and rising. It's still 42 percent. And if you look at the angry votes, far right, left, and far right, they're they're much stronger than the main parties. Why is France so divided? They are not main. To, they are not stronger than the main parties because the the, the main party in France is La République En Marche. It's, it's Emmanuel Macron. It's 28 percent in the first round. Just no, do I not mean, forget that because I, some people yeah. would like to say, no, we didn't win the election. It's the uh, only Emmanuel, uh, Marine Le Pen uh, yeah. who's been defeated, uh, yeah, who defeated, who's been defeated uh, y yesterday. This is not only that. This is uh, the message of France saying to the world and saying to, to, uh, to herself but, that we will not go to the far right. Yeah. This, uh, this I understand. And I understand. My, my point was that the angry vote, so the far left and the far right together were extremely strong. There were more than 50% yeah. of the French vote. So I imagine Emmanuel Macron today looks at those figures and says, what can I do to get more people behind me? Yeah, the, the question and we have to answer is, how can we make sure that people are not left behind the way uh, through globalization? This is one of the main points. Uh, how we uh, empower themselves, uh, them in the in the European construction, in the European Union. This was not. A, this could have been a, a referendum for or against Europe, and the, the answer was yes. Yesterday, that is the point. He is but, reforming the country. Yeah. He has been reforming the country for five years, yes. for the last years, and now we have to say to the people that. Uh, the results are there. Yeah. The results are there. And but, but unemployment rate is the lowest since I, decades. In I understand, France. but this wasn't a referendum on Europe because Marine but, Le Pen but, did not run on this, right? No. She, she did not run on an anti Europe campaign. Well, we all know uh, what Marine Le Pen wants for uh, France. She says, w I don't want to destroy the European Union, but I want to leave the free market. I want to, well, the euro is, uh, is, is okay, but five years ago she wanted to, to leave uh, the eurozone. Uh, so the, the reality is the program of Marine Le Pen is living, uh, is Frexit, in fact. Yeah, but which she denied actually also in the debate last Wednesday. Talk to me a little bit about what that means for the European Union today. So you have France with Emmanuel Macron at 58 percent. We then have, I guess, a, a bit of concern about the Italian elections that could be coming up. Is this a sweet start, spot for Europe to do more in the parliament, maybe to get also behind Ukraine? Well, the, 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 the first thing is that, yes, this is a good news for uh, Europe, the re-election of uh, Emmanuel Macron. The second thing is in Slovenia, as well, yesterday there were elections and the anti-populist uh, party won this election. So the pro-European party won the election in Slovenia. This is one of the 27 countries. So this is uh, two good news in, in the same night uh, yesterday. What does it mean? It means that 
We have to continue on the way we have begun with the, this conference for the future of Europe. We, we, we don't know here in France that there is this conference, but the goal of this conference is to propose uh, which Europe the citizens want. And this is absolutely crucial for the yeah. next years. We have to show that Europe can be useful to all the citizens here in France. How? So is it through, if inflation is going up, people feel poorer, or the cost of living standard is going down. What can Europe do for, you know, Mr. John, uh, Jean in Paris today? Mr. Jean. Mr. Jean. <laughs> it's usually Mr. He's Jean. Asking. But why not? We, we welcome everyone here in France. Well, um, that, that, that's the point. There is one thing that has been uh, really important in this election, that the unemployment was not a topic of the debate. Nobody talked about that. Five years ago, and in fact, since the day, well, since I was born, uh, we've been talking about unemployment. I remember when I was 20, the, 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 the situation was, oh, you are going to, you will have to make a good, good studies to have a great job, good diploma, and so on. In the early now, 2000s, this now, was. Yeah, in the 2000s. Yeah. And even five years ago. And now the fact is that the unemployment rate is so low that it is difficult to find people for some jobs. So we have now to, to be sure that this will have uh, uh, an influence that this will be a reality even in the, f the, the smallest town in the smallest uh, places in, in France this means uh, school mm -hmm. studies and uh, uh, adapting skills of people. Pierre, thank you so much for joining us today. That was Pierre Cardeskind, a member of the European Parliament for Macron's party La République En Marche. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First World News. Here's Leanne Guerin. Hi Leanne. Hi, Francine. ECB President Christine Lagarde said that while both the US and Europe are struggling to contain soaring inflation, they are also facing a different beast. She told CBS the Euro Area Central Bank will use the most appropriate tools for taming inflation. Lagarde said 50% of Europe's current record inflation stems from surging energy costs. Now, palm oil prices have rallied after top producer Indonesia said it will ban all exports of cooking oil and a move that threatens to worsen global food inflation. Indonesia will halt shipments later this week. That adds to a raft of crop protectionism measures around the world since the war erupted in Ukraine. Indonesia accounts for almost 60% of all global palm oil supply. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts and more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francie. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin hold talks with President Zelensky in Kiev. More on the war in Ukraine next. This is Bloomberg. of Russia's war aims. Russia has already failed and Ukraine has already succeeded because the principal aim that President Putin brought to this in his own words was to fully subsume Ukraine back into Russia to take away its sovereignty and independence. And that has not happened and clearly will not happen. Well, that was the Secretary of State of, uh, for, well, in the U.S., Antony Blinken. Now, let's keep the conversation on the latest on the war in Ukraine. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Europe correspondent, Maria Tadeo. Maria, first of all, bring us up to date with the latest. This was the highest level, of course, of U.S. officials showing up in Kyiv. Do we know what they discussed? Yes, Francine, and remember, this is, of course, uh, Tony Blinken heading to uh, Kyiv. They want to reopen the embassy in the Ukrainian capital. The Americans were among the first to pull out of uh, Kyiv just before the start of the war. Remember, that intel that they had was spot on. It, it was correct, the idea that there was going to be an invasion. And, Francine, you know, the language coming out of this meeting, which, of course, was pre-recorded uh, for security reasons, and now we're just finding out the details. Uh, Blinken told Zelensky at this point, 
point, it is clear uh, that Ukraine will be around for longer than Vladimir Putin will be on the scene. It's unclear what that means. Nonetheless, he does say that Ukraine will win the war and that the United States will do everything possible until uh, Ukraine gets to final success. Of course, this is a big show of support, not just symbolically, but also we're seeing another financial package of aid going to Ukraine. The United States pumping billions into this country, which is, of course, heading to a 35% GDP contraction this year and more weapons into Ukraine, too. Maria, thanks so much. Our European correspondent, Maria, though, there in Brussels. Coming up, encore Emmanuel Macron clinches a second term as French president. We'll have all of the latest from Paris. We'll talk about reforms. We'll, of course, talk about those parliamentary elections in June. This is Bloomberg. China's COVID outbreak spreads, Beijing orders mandatory testing while sparking fears of an unprecedented lockdown of the capital. Macron's en car, while the French president defeats right-wing challenger Marine Le Pen to secure another five-year term. And Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin pledge more aid on a visit to Kiev. U.S. officials promise more than $700 million in financial assistance. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Paris. So a lot of the focus on the markets. The market's really focusing, well, falling out of bed, I would say, risk-off mood across the board. China has ordered mandatory COVID tests in a district of Beijing and locked down some areas in the capital as policymakers race to prevent a repeat of the outbreak. That's hobbled Shanghai for weeks. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's Enda Kern. Enda, always great to speak to you. So thank you so much for coming on. Very worrying signs out of Beijing, and this is really spooking the markets. Just bring us up to date on what you're hearing on the ground. Yeah, well, the big concern, Francine, is that Beijing now goes the way of Shanghai. The officials have warned that cases are increasing. Like I mentioned, they're running through a mass testing system for Chaoyang in the eastern part of the city. Uh, about a dozen compounds have been sealed off. Residential compounds have also been sealed off, and there's been reports of panic buying among residents too. Now, at the same time, of course, Shanghai's lockdown continues, and the authorities there continue to double down on the zero COVID approach, and that's why we're seeing these jitters now flow through markets with the yuan, onshore yuan, weakening to its most by its most in a year. Stocks selling off back to 2020 levels, and all the concerns are that the authorities are struggling to keep control of COVID now, with the obvious knock-on consequences that will have for China's economic recovery and of course all kinds of warnings now about the pressures that China's recovery will be facing in the months ahead. So is there anything that officials can do to help minimize the damage both on you know citizens who are looking also for food and things like that but also on the financial side maybe with PBOC intervention? Well, the, there is an expectation among analysts that the, the lockdowns in Shanghai might ease over coming weeks and when they ease, you know, the authorities will be quick to make sure that industrial production gets back up the track. They've already taken steps to do so and, of course, that they will allow residents and consumption to get back on track as well. But all of that is predicated, for, in, in the case of Shanghai, for getting those cases under control and quickly. And it's a similar story in Beijing, Francine. It's all predicated on Beijing getting its cases under control quickly. If it spins out of control and it has a kind of Shanghai-style fiasco that we've seen over recent weeks, then obviously that will add to the very negative sentiment towards China's economy at the moment, given not just the COVID problems, but the pressure on the real estate sector and, of course, signs of a slowing export sector as well. So there's likely going to be plenty of work for the authorities to do to support growth in the weeks and months ahead. And uh, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Chief North Asia Correspondent Enda Kern there with the very latest on the lockdowns. Now, it's a largely risk-off, in fact, very risk-off day in the market. Stocks and commodities slumping as China's worsening COVID outbreak fuels fears of a bigger slowdown. Let's get more from our markets reporter, Justina Lee. Justina, why are the markets so freaked out? I know they're reacting to the COVID spread in China, but we could have possibly predicted this a couple of weeks ago with lockdown pictures in Beijing and also with that uprest in certain parts of Beijing. 
Yeah, I mean, Chinese stocks are plunging today. So is the yuan. I mean, the Chinese currency is now the weakest in 17 months, and it's really spreading through global markets. I mean, European stocks is down, you know, about 1.7 percent right now. Your, um, U.S. futures are down as well. And I think part of that reflects market, you know, investors' concerns that maybe Chinese policymakers cannot be as supportive as investors would like. So, Justine, are Chinese policymakers going to do anything about it? What does it mean for PBOC and what does it mean divergence between PBOC and the rest of the central banks? Right, exactly. I mean, that's the issue right now. And that's why investors were quite disappointed last Friday when the PBOC cut the reserve requirements less than they expected and did not cut interest rates. And I think that really reflects the difficult position that Chinese policymakers are in right now. Because on one hand, they need to support the economy. You know, there are further downside risks. But on the other hand, they, they're worried about capital outflows and further pressure on the yuan, given that Chinese policymakers are now basically moving in the exact opposite direction as the rest of the world. Justina, it's interesting for me that the markets aren't reacting so much to the French election result. And I don't know whether it's because they didn't price in a Marine Le Pen risk or whether they're just looking to the news of China and so worried about that and the impact it has on inflation and therefore central bank Fed policy. Yeah, I think the reaction today kind of shows you that investors were never exactly worried about, you know, the chance of an upset by Marine Le Pen. I mean, of course, if she had one, I mean, we would have seen, we would be seeing a very dramatic reaction in markets today. But I think really markets are focused on the risk from China slowdown. I mean, we have the euro weakening further today because it's all about, you know, the dollar and it's all about safe havens today. All about the dollar. Thank you, Justina Lee there from our markets team. Now, coming up, Beijing orders mandatory COVID testing, sparking fears of an unprecedented lockdown of the capital. We'll get plenty more, of course, in the fallout that we're seeing across global markets. We'll also talk about the French results with Antoine Flammarion. He's from Ticoro. This is a Bloomberg. I believe that um, we share the same resolve, uh, which is to tame inflation, which is to use all the tools that we have to do so. But we are facing a different beast. We have to use the tools and the uh, sequence, mm -hmm. which is appropriate depending on the sources of inflation. If I raise interest rates today, it is not going to bring the price of energy down. ECB President Christine Lagarde, they're talking about inflation now. Joining us for more about inflation, the markets, the French election, there's so much going on, is Ticoho co-founder Antoine Flammarion. He joins me here on the rooftops of Paris. I've just been dreaming of saying that, Antoine, because look at Paris, it's beautiful. It's the day after the election. Macron got 58 percent. So much concern, actually, about this divided and divisive France. Where does he go next in the next five years? Hello, Francine. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's true that when you see, when you look at the result, it's pretty fragmented and what, what we can see in Europe and in the UK as well is that you know world is fragmented and I think moving forward for Macron for President Macron it's gonna be a big challenge to make sure that he's really the French president of all the French people. Does it mean that he needs to spend more that actually deficits go out the window we were just hearing from Christine Lagarde saying about inflation we still have the raging war in Ukraine how much more difficult will it get for the common person on the street? It's a balance because you know spending money is good but you have to make sure it channel in the real economy and I think in this fragmentation both political social and economic what you need to do is make sure that all the money spent is going really in the real economy and right. I, I think that the key the key theme will be a real economy and channeling the money there but it has to go to the people that have had the angry votes does it not otherwise yeah. the parliamentary election for France and actually reforms it's game over I mean hundred percent and what we see probably since 2008 is that the money has been really channeled through the same people, mainly through the capital market, and you yeah. need to make sure that it's go broadly uh, to all the country. The market today is looking beyond, of course, the encouraging news that the market wanted broadly that Macron stays at president. They're looking at China and they're being freaked out because of the lockdowns. What are they really worried about? Well, I think, you know, probably the super cycle of the low interest rate 
is finished. So now any new bad news uh, is, will create a lot of turbulence. And obviously, you know, the lockdown being longer in China and probably everybody should have expected that. But as a result, you know, people get concerned and it's a minus 5% today on the back of minus almost, you know, three in the US. And that will continue. There will be volatility. But Antoine, are they worried about Beijing, you know, particularly? Because for me, the market should worry, look, if there's a big port where you need to get in and out commodities or if they use less steel or some of the other things that we need globally, then that's a huge deal. But if you lock down a capital, what does it mean for an investor on the CAC 40, on the FTSE or on Wall Street? No, and I think you know people and, and companies and investors are stressed, and each time it's becoming really uncharted, like the war, uh, unfortunately, in Ukraine. You know the rules are changing, and when the rules are changing, people get super stressed and concerned, and, and maybe people start getting a little bit concerned with China, yeah. because if they start you know changing the rule and, and, and you know enabling less people to channel back their money, it's a concern. So that's why you know you you probably yeah. rather sell and and stay away. So what does it mean to, for Tico Ho? I also catch up with your uh, co-founder, actually, from time to time. I mean, you're very focused on some of the big energy sectors and some of this transition. Where do you find value today? You know, I think in this challenging world, you have to be, on one end, very cautious. But we are entrepreneur in the financial industry. So there are so many things to do, especially all the transition. You have to finance energy transition, digital transition, cybersecurity, agricultural. So, you know, we see a lot of opportunities in, for instance, the, in the four area I mentioned. Globally, in you've Europe, got... Opportunities it, it, and it's global. And, and yeah. you know, Europe going to be more volatile, as usual, more challenging, but that's, you know, create more opportunities, I guess. So you need to be global, and now we are really operating on all the continents. But I think, you know, we are born in France, we are French, we're operating mainly uh, in Europe, and we see opportunities in Italy, in Spain, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in the UK as well. So, and, and you're worried that you'll overpay for them, but that they're good targets, or you think you'll get a bargain? I think, you know, valuation remain very high, but with this, with this interest rate uh, movement, I think valuation will decline. And people have been living with crazy valuation for 15 years, and everybody has been, you know, saw what happened in the US in the tech. I mean, nobody realized, but PayPal has been divided by three, Alibaba by three, I don't know, DD by 20, and, and you can, you know, add and add and add. And I think valuation will start changing, and that's means for long-term investors like us and entrepreneurs, you know, a lot of opportunities to finance, to invest with successful entrepreneurs. I know you first really came in the limelight with the biggest use of SPAC, which was a SPAC spearheaded yeah. by the former Unicredit uh, chief executive Jean-Pierre Musquet. Do you have a target for it? I think you need to find one by the end of the year. Yeah, so, you know, we see the SPAC as a tool of our business. It's about raising money yeah. and investing in, in successful companies. With our partner, Bernard Arnault, we launched three SPACs, two in Europe, one in uh, Singapore. I think in the coming weeks or months, uh, we'll probably make an announcement. You know, teams are working very hard. Uh, Jean-Pierre and Diego are, are working very hard on the three SPACs with the team. And I think, you know, you need to find the right target. And it's a question right. of valuation because it's, you know, in our SPAC, we put our own money. So it's a little bit different than what people have been doing. It's really skin in the game. So we want to make sure we find the right target. And so you have, you have a target, you have a couple of targets. And what kind of, what kind of thing is it? So, you know, very quickly, the first pack is financial services. The yeah. second pack is entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And as you know, in Europe, you've got tons of successful entrepreneurs. So, you know, we'll see what's the first pack to this pack or to but announce. Entrepreneurs from what? From fintech? I mean, it's such a broad thing. Really cool. And we never quite, we have great entrepreneurs, but they never quite become the Facebook that you can make in the States. I think, it, 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 you know, we don't have such big companies in Europe, but I think the movement is there and I think it's accelerating because, you know, a while back, you know, when you look at luxury, you know, LVMH is a 300 billion company. So, you know, it's a big company and it's set up by an entrepreneur. And you see that in the telecom with Niel or uh, you know, you, you, tons of Dassault, for instance, or another entrepreneurial journey. Uh, so, you know, we are aiming and looking at, at the next, you know, big entrepreneurs. Antoine, if you're not wearing a hoodie, are you really an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, you, 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 <laughs> you know. You have to be like Mark Zuckerberg, no? You, you know, yeah, but, you know, entrepreneurs are ambitious, and it takes time. Nobody realizes, but if I take our own journey, which has yeah. been, you know, colorful, crazy, the pandemic, the 2008 crisis, we started with $4 million. You know, now we manage, you know, $35 billion. It's a $4 billion market cap company. It takes yeah. time. 
you know, probably in the U.S. it go a little bit quickly, quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think in Europe we have a huge generation of talented entrepreneurs, and that will lead to huge company. What, what is it specifically the, the most subsector that you're most excited by in in Europe? So. When it comes to SPAC, you know, the first SPAC is financial services. The entire financial services industry is changing. We used to have banks, insurance yeah. company, but now you have fintech, alternative asset manager, independent advisor. So we look at all that, uh, some subspecific sector of insurance, and there are a lot of opportunities because the money is still there, a lot of capital, a lot of companies to finance. All right, thank you so much for joining us. That was Antoine Flammarion with Tikeho, co-founder. Now, let's great, get straight to your Bloomberg business flash. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Good morning, Francine. Palm oil prices have rallied after top producer Indonesia said it will ban all exports, exports of cooking oil in a move that threatens to worsen global food inflation. Indonesia will halt shipments later this week. That adds to a raft of crop protectionism measures around the world since the war erupted in Ukraine. Indonesia accounts for almost 60% of global palm oil supply. And Nissan shares have fallen on reports that Renault is considering selling part of its stake in the Japanese car maker. The move could raise billions of euros for Renault's shift to electric vehicles and ease long-standing tensions with its alliance partner. The French company owns 43% of Nissan. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the White House could be open to scaling back tariffs on imports from China. While well, Janet Yellen told Bloomberg it's worth re-examining the Trump era duties to help provide Americans relief from the fastest inflation in four decades. Judging by the U.S. unemployment rate now and um, other measures of the performance of the labor market, it's been decades since we've seen such a strong a job market with such um, right. excellent uh, employment opportunities for people. You you can see that in the right. high quit rate and the enormous right. level of uh, job openings. Right. So, uh, you know, the Fed is concerned about inflation. They've right. made clear that they will be removing accommodation to try to get right. it under control. But um, I know they'll try to achieve a soft landing and um, it, with some skill and some luck, um, we'll, we'll have a very good year for the U.S. economy in terms of the job market this coming year. Let's talk about China, because you referred to that in a speech last week before the Atlantic Council, basically saying uh, you really wanted China to really help the United States bring pressure to bear on Russia to stop the travesty that's going on right now in Ukraine. What can the United States do to mo more than just uh, jawbone or persuade and actually get things done? And let me be specific. What about secondary sanctions? Could that really urge the Chinese to move in our direction? Well, look, I, I don't see China at this point as undermining the impact of our sanctions. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, Chinese financial institutions are avoiding, they, they very much value their access to the U.S. financial system, um, to their economic relations with the United States and Europe. And I'm not seeing them as taking steps to undermine sanctions. We've made clear that that would be unacceptable um, to us. And um, made clear that it would be unacceptable to um, help Russia add to its uh, stock of arms to conduct this war. We mm -hmm. would like to see them do more to take advantage of their relationship with Russia to try to bring about a diplomatic end to this war. Yeah. Nothing would be better for yeah. the outlook for real growth throughout the global economy right. or for inflation to other than stopping this war. Well, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen there speaking with our very own David Weston. And we're seeing quite a lot of pressure on stocks across the world that started in China with the concerns that a Chinese lockdown will last much longer than expected. We're concerned, the markets are concerned that Beijing will go into lockdown. European stocks, 600, actually extending their losses, falling now over 2%. Now, we'll have plenty more on the markets. Also, Twitter warns to, warms to Elon Musk's takeover offer. So we'll have all the details next. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition of Francine Lacroix here in Paris. Well, Elon Musk and Twitter executives are said to be meeting as a social media company turns more receptive to towards his $43 billion takeover offer. Well, joining us now is Alex Webb from Bloomberg Twit Take, who looks always at some of the tech companies. So what has changed, Alex, over the weekend? Well, the real news is that the Twitter board is willing to meet with Elon Musk. It seems they may have meet, uh, met over the weekend. We're yet to have any reporting on what came of that meeting. Ultimately, perhaps it was inevitable, given that they had said uh, that they, w if the part of the reason for reducing the poison pill I concept was that they didn't want to have negotiations or they didn't want to bid that was hostile with anyone. They wanted to have a conversation with them. Well, in that case, they've got to be open to having the conversation on their side as well. So, Alex, what can Musk do actually to get them on side? Can he go higher? Does he even want the board's support? Will he keep them or will they have to go if he takes over? Uh, well, it's hard to know what he will do with the board. If he if, if things stay as they are and he doesn't make a bid, he can't do much to the board because of the way the voting structure is set up, i.e. they only appoint board members every few years. You don't you can't vote to replace the whole board in one go. In terms of what he needs to do to convince them, it, it, it's really a financial question that at the moment or in the early phases of this whole affair, it didn't really seem that Elon's play was financial. It seemed to be about other things, not least his um, desire for free speech in his perception of it on the platform. But of course, that's not what shareholders want. Shareholders want the best value for their investment. That's the board's responsibility. So it seems that he might be pivoting mm -hmm. to try to convince them on that basis. Alex, do we have any clarity on the plans at all? Well, it does seem as though that pivot that I just mentioned is starting to happen. He had some calls with uh, prospective financiers of his bid, because while Elon is worth a huge amount of money, uh, that is mostly tied up in his other investments, not least Tesla. And so he is having to seek financing, external financing for the bid in order to secure that financing. He and his representatives were presenting to banks and to potential investors those people clearly needed to hear a financial reason for why Elon's investing, for what he thinks he can do to turn it around. It seems as though they might have heard good enough reasons on that basis because they, many of them are willing to provide some financing. So that is a change, and it seems as though it isn't just about the free speech play. Alex, thanks so much. Alex Webb there with the very latest on Elon Musk and the very latest on Twitter. In the meantime, it is a big market day, so let's look at what the European Stock 600 are telling us. They're extending losses. They're down some 2%. It's all about what's happening in China. Stocks and commodities really tumbling after China's worsening COVID outbreak, compounded fears sparked by faster Federal Reserve tightening. I'm looking at crude below $100. Also, as a Beijing COVID outbreak seems to be imperiling demand. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller and Kay Lines in New York, Anna Edwards in London, and live from Paris. Good morning, everyone. This is Bloomberg. Free inflationary boom, we're not in stagflation. We want to do everything that we can to lower inflation. I think we're going to end up living with uh, more inflation uh, than uh, the rhetoric is suggesting. We think that this hawkish rhetoric from central banks around the world is not going to stop anytime soon. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Monday, April 25th. Our top stories today. It's a risk-off mood in the markets. Emmanuel Macron's re-election in France removed one area of market concern, but the threat of more lockdowns in China has stocks tumbling. The U.S. is pledging another $700 million in aid for Ukraine and its allies. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin met with President Zelensky in Kiev. And Twitter now appears more receptive to Elon Musk's takeover offer. Musk and company executives held talks about what could be one of the biggest ever internet deals. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lyons in New York. And Kaylee, we were just playing some sound bites there, some clips of people talking, market uh, participants talking a lot about inflation. That has dominated the conversation over recent weeks. But today, the focus turns from inflation to growth and specifically in China. 
Absolutely. And China and concern around lockdowns there also potentially could exacerbate supply chain issues and therefore inflation, Anna. So that is something that this market is grappling with. What that meant was it was a pretty painful day for Asian equities overnight. Definitely painful if you were long uh, Asian equity markets. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index falling 2% overall, but it was really Hong Kong and China that led those declines. The CSI 300, the benchmark in China, falling nearly 5%. Its worst day since February 2020, falling to its lowest since April of 2020. 2020. The concern really being that lockdowns and COVID zero is now spreading. Now lockdowns potentially uh, happening in Beijing. That weighing on risk assets, also weighing on the Chinese yuan. Weaker against the dollar by nearly a full percent. It is far and away the worst uh, Asian currency performance against the dollar today. Right now, it's at its weakest since November of 2020. And then, of course, concerns around growth in China also fuel concern around demand for commodities. That weighing on most of them in Asia overnight, including iron ore. Futures down about 11 percent in Singapore. We're interesting on that one commodity bucking that trend, palm oil actually was up about 3% after an export ban from Indonesia. Matt. Well, you need Nutella no matter what the economy looks <laughs> like. Uh, take a look here at U uh, U.S. futures. We're down about 1%. And don't forget that we closed down 2.7% in the cash trade on Friday. So investors continue um, concerns about holding equities. It looked like they didn't want to hold anything into the weekend. Well, maybe they don't want to hold anything into the week either. There's a lot of talk about the Fed narrative being one reason for the sell-off. I just don't buy that. We knew the Fed was super hawkish already on Friday before the markets opened. Remember, Nomura was forecasting a 50 basis point hike followed by two 75 basis point hikes, one after the other. And investors are buying treasuries right now. We were at 297 on Friday afternoon, and we're down from that about 15 basis points. So if you thought the Fed was going to hike even more than you thought last week, why would you go out and buy the paper now? NYMEX crude off 5%. This is really another sign that it's all about China. China. It's all about a concern for demand. 96.98 for Texas Intermediate and Bitcoin down almost 3% this morning to 38,431. Anna, what do you see in terms of European markets? Yeah, here on European markets, just agreeing with what you're saying there, Matt. Just a very different picture from last week. Last week was all about hawkishness from central banks and higher yields. Today is not about that. According to our colleagues on the Markets Live blog, this looks more like a classic risk off. Concern around growth in China really filtering through into the global psyche. Certainly the European psyche taking that uh, very much to heart. And you see the European equity markets firmly in the red, down by more than 2%. And at session lows or near session lows for many of these European equity markets. In terms of one of the Sectors that's really at the forefront of that. Matt, you were mentioning oil prices weaker. I've got oil prices here as well. The Brent price, 101.24, so still above $100 a barrel, but falling fast, down by more than 5% on the oil price in just today's session. Basic resource stocks also under pressure today, and this in keeping with this being all about global growth, so down by more than 5%. Although I have to say that that was an area of weakness for European stocks last week. We saw a lot of pressure on the basic resource sector, on the mining sector in last week's session, as if we were slightly... Uh, concerned there about global growth as well. Here's the euro, the euro down by four tenths of one percent. And this is really interesting in the context of what happened in France. You might have expected the euro to get some support. Maybe there was a little bit of that initially uh, as the kind of, you know, as you were verdict for the French politics uh, for the French presidential election. We'll get more on that from Paris shortly. But then we saw, of course, the dollar getting again, the yuan falling and all of that theme uh, running across FX markets and dominating and the euro just another victim of dollar strength, it would seem. Philips, really interesting in terms of the earnings story. So down by more than 9% in session today. This is an electronic, uh, sorry, a, a medical equipment manufacturer now, essentially. And they have they missed estimates. And this is what happens when you miss estimates in this kind of earnings story. Uh, and they are putting up prices they're trying to counter those higher costs, but they're warning that they could see those higher costs still in the weeks and the years ahead. They're talking about inflation into the years ahead. Quick word on Russia. Will they, won't they, in Europe, put a ban on any more Russian energy assets? Is one of the big questions we still have. There's been plenty of reporting around that over the weekend, and reportedly that weighs on stocks over in Russia today, Kaylee. All right, Anna, well, we will definitely pay attention to any developments on that front. But also, it's going to be a very, very big week for earnings. You have HSBC and UBS kicking off European bank earnings tomorrow. More than 500 Chinese companies will be reporting earnings this week, including big financials, airlines, and car makers. Then here in the U.S., we'll get results from big oil companies with ExxonMobil and Chevron reporting, plus more tech companies reporting, including Amazon, Alphabet, Meta, and Twitter. But it's not just going to be about earnings. We'll have news on economic data as well, growth and inflation figures coming from both Europe and the U.S., Anna.
Yeah, absolutely. So earnings and growth really front and centre. In terms of the growth story, let's talk about China. The coronavirus outbreak has uh, become worse. A rising number of cases in Beijing has sparked jitters about an unprecedented lockdown of the capital. Policymakers are racing to avert a Shanghai-style crisis. Let's get more from Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie, who joins me here on set in London and has been monitoring developments over in China. Tom, take us through where we've got to then on the lockdown story in China, because this has been something we've seen building for a long time, but now this is Beijing and this is different. Yeah, absolutely. This is the capital, of course, the political capital for China, and they've been looking at what's been going on in Shanghai, three straight weeks or more of lockdowns there. The implications for this and for China, for Beijing, the capital, obviously very significant. What we're seeing on the ground is a major district called Chaoyang, home to three and a half million people. They've instigated officials there, lockdowns in some residential compounds. They've said that every single member of a population living in that area has to be tested over three periods, three times over the week. And I've been messaging with people on the ground there. They've been stocking up on food. They can't get fruit and vegetable. They can't get eggs. The supermarket shelves are empty because, of course, they've been looking at what's been happening in Shanghai. So there's hoarding that's going on in Beijing right now. It would be unprecedented. Just to re-emphasize, Beijing was never under an official lockdown. It's never been under an official lockdown. So if it goes in that direction and mirrors what happens in Shanghai, it would be unprecedented. In Shanghai, you continue to see very high levels of cases. Uh, close to 20,000 is the last count and record numbers of deaths. And officials there have actually ramped up the restrictions even further by doing things like putting metal barriers in place. So certainly people on the ground in Beijing are watching this very carefully indeed. You've talked about the economic impact. To some, on some level, it's surprising the markets are playing, are taking so long to play catch up on this. Uh, but we continue to watch the case accounts and you could expect those to rise over the week ahead as they continue with this mass testing. All right, Tom, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie there talking about the Chinese COVID crackdown. Now, it's the highest level U.S. visit to Ukraine since Russia's invasion. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin met with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky in Kiev late Sunday night and promised more military aid. Listen to Blinken earlier. In terms of Russia's war aims, Russia has already failed and Ukraine has already succeeded because the principal aim that President Putin brought to this, in his own words, was to fully subsume Ukraine back into Russia, to take away its sovereignty and independence. And that has not happened and clearly will not happen. Anne-Marie Horder, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now out of D.C. So is this a sign that the administration is willing to get more involved here? Well, I believe so. You have uh, two top officials coming from the Biden administration. The first time we've seen this since the war began. It was supposed to be a secret clandestine mission until, of course, President Zelensky actually announced it. But they still went ahead with their pl plans to go forward with this meeting. President Zelensky just recently uh, taking to a video talking about the fact that this lasted more than three hours. He said it was meaningful and fruitful. Fruitful because, one, there's going to be more military aid going to Ukraine, uh, most notably at the moment, $165 million worth of ammunition going to the Ukrainian army. But also Secretary Blinken following that meeting in Kiev, talking about the fact that they will be sending American diplomats back to Ukraine as soon as next week. And the process will begin to reopen the embassy in Kiev. And then this morning, State Department official telling Bloomberg that President of the United States will announce his pick for the next envoy for Ukraine, and it'll be the ambassador at the moment uh, for uh, Sl Slovakia. All right, so that's the latest on foreign policy. And Marie, let's talk domestic policy as well, because Senator Elizabeth Warren issuing a warning to her fellow Democrats yesterday. She says that the party must push through legislation to tamp down soaring prices ahead of the midterms coming up in just a few months. She spoke yesterday. Take a listen. I think we're going to be in real trouble if we don't get up and deliver then I believe that Democrats are going to lose. Democrats win when they do what when they work on behalf of working people. That was Elizabeth Warren on CNN. Anne-Marie, the question, though, is what can they actually do legislatively that's going to control inflation? Yeah, Senator Warren is really saying out loud what has vexed the Democratic Party this entire time, that inflation is going to be their biggest hurdle. And already they're on the back foot when you look at historically 
how the president's party has done, whether or not it's the House or the Senate, they have lost seats, and already the Democrats hold slim majorities. If you listen further to that interview, she lays out three things she thinks the party should do. One, she says stop the price gouging, so going for authorizing the FTC to go after companies that she claims are price gouging. She says, two, the, there should be um, a stop on student debt. This would help with inflation, in her mind. And then, uh, finally, her third one is um, attack corruption head on Washington, so that they should have legislation in Washington so members of Congress should not be able to buy and trade in stocks. So these are three of the items she laid out that she thinks that if the Democratic Party could get done and show that they can deliver, potentially they can win some of those seats in November. Anne-Marie, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern with the latest from Washington. Emmanuel Macron has defeated uh, Marine Le Pen in France's presidential election on a pro-business, pro-EU platform. Macron took more than 58% of the vote, making him the first incumbent in two decades to win a second term. Here's what the candidates had to say after the vote. This day of the 24th of April 2022, a majority among us made the choice to entrust in me the presidency of our republic for the five years to come. In defeat, I cannot help but feel a kind of hope. For our French and European leaders, this result is evidence that cannot be ignored of how the French people greatly distrust them and a broad aspiration for change. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix has been leading our coverage of the election in Paris. And Macron, no doubt then, Francine, pleased, of course, that he has won, but very mindful of the, uh, the size of the, uh, and the level of support that went to the far right in this vote. Yes, 100%, Anand, good morning. Also, the markets, uh, actually looking at that tail risk, uh, it was largely uh, expected that if Marine Le Pen won, it could have a pretty big shock on the markets, similar to what Brexit had the day after. It, the UK voted to come out of the EU. Uh, very clearly, also the kind of shock that we saw to the markets the day after President Trump got elected. So that tail risk has now been taken off the table, but don't let the numbers fool you. Emmanuel Macron being really elected with a 58% 0.5% of the vote does not mean that he's a very popular president, and he recognizes in his victory speech that it was also a vote blocking the far right. What he now needs to do today, and we've been speaking to people within his party, is refocus and regroup and try to get as many votes as possible in the parliamentary election of June if he wants to govern with power. If he does not, then there's fragmentation in Europe, there's fragmentation in France, something that we're already seeing. And there's something unique to the French electoral system, which is a cohabitation, when you have a president and prime minister not from the same party. And if we have that post-elections in June, it would be very difficult to France to function properly in terms of reforms and economic growth. Francine, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix on the ground in Paris, or rather on a roof in Paris. <laughs> um, Twitter is growing more receptive to Elon Musk's $43 billion takeover offer. That's after the two sides held talks about what could be one of the biggest internet acquisitions we've seen. Let's get more with Alex Webb from Bloomberg Quick Take. Alex? Yes, over the weekend we had some news that uh, Elon is meeting with the board. Uh, that was a change. He, the board had been shaping up maybe to enact a poison pill, which would have made it harder for Elon to make an acquisition. That is still something that's on the table. But, of course, they would prefer to have a deal which is negotiated. And from the board's perspective, at the very least, get a better price than this 5420, which some people seem not to like. Yeah, Twitter right now trading at 49.28, up about seven tenths of a percent in pre-market. Alex Webb of Bloomberg Quick Take, thank you so much. Now, as for some other stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S., it isn't just U.S. technology; it is Chinese technology stocks as well. Those ADRs under pressure in early hours, following on from the selling we saw in China overnight due to concerns around those lockdowns and growth fears. There, you have Alibaba and Baidu each down the better part of four percent. And of course, as we've been discussing, you also are seeing commodities weighed down by the idea that demand from China is going to be diminished, and that is weighing on a lot of commodity-tied stocks in early hours, especially those energy players, the likes of EQT and Occidental, which are, of course, both E&Ps. EQT down about 3.4 percent, Oxy down nearly five full percentage points before the bell, Anna.
Coming up on the program then, Kaylee, Macron's election victory removing a key risk for markets. But now China's worsening COVID outbreak is taking the spotlight. We will discuss the markets with Frederick Roland, investment strategist at Pictet Asset Management. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. We are simulcast on both radio and television. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kaylee Lines, Anna Edwards with us out of London. Now we're seeing so many crises um, that the <laughs> yuan uh, is rising or rather losing ground against the greenback. In fact, it's been the worst week for the Chinese currency since 2015. And there was kind of a devaluation at the time. So, um, you know, that made a lot of sense then. This is about lockdowns, the possibility of the capital locking down and COVID zero policy just being uh, forged on with. Justina Lee joins us, Bloomberg Markets reporter, um, to talk about how this is the cause for falling equity indexes in Europe and weak futures in the U.S. Justina? Yeah, and I think the chart you're showing is really important because it kind of illustrates the bind Beijing is in right now. They want to support the economy, but they're worried about more pressure on the yuan and capital outflows. And I think that's partly why you're seeing such a big reaction in markets today. They're worried about the drop in demand in China, as well as at the same time, you know, maybe China not being able to help as much as, you know, investors would want. Mm. So we've been we've been worried about Chinese growth, but then there's been this expectation, Justina, that authorities would step in and support growth. And if the Chinese currency continues to weaken, that maybe can't happen. Uh, it seems to be the thinking you're, you're outlining. How does that, in fact, impact Europe? Because uh, as a result or in the mix, the euro down by half a percent against the US dollar on a day when we thought that perhaps Macron's win might support the currency. Right. I mean, the China news is really overshadowing the French election results today. And the euro is down because it's all about safe havens today. So the greenback is pretty strong. And at the same time, we're seeing a much bigger reaction in European stocks. And I think that's because there is a higher weighting of commodity stocks as well as just cyclical names in general than the U.S. And we're seeing a really big move today in the stocks Europe 600. Justina, you're also seeing a bid into treasuries. Speaking of a flight into safe haven assets, the 10-year yield is down about eight basis points, yet NASDAQ 100 futures are still down nearly a full percent. Does that correlation not matter on a day like today? Yeah, it's really interesting because earlier we were seeing stocks and bonds falling at the same time when markets were focused on inflation. But today we can see that markets are far more worried about downside risk on the economy. And that's why we're seeing that big move in global bonds. And I think another reflection of that is that commodity prices are plunging across the board, especially when it comes to oil and metals because of concern that maybe Chinese demand will be much weaker than previously expected. Justina, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Justina Lee with the latest on the markets. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on your terminal. They will have for all the details you need on the weakness in European stocks today, down by 2.1% on the stock 600 this hour. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. For the first time, global military spending has gone over $2 trillion per year, and it's likely to rise further as European countries beef up their armed forces in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, military spending has now increased for seven years in a row. Meanwhile, wages increased at a record 70 percent of U.S. companies in the first quarter. That's according to a survey by the National Association for Business Economics. About half of the firms surveyed are still reporting shortages of skilled labor. And ECB President Christine Lagarde says Europe and the U.S. are, quote, facing a different beast in their fights against inflation. Lagarde told CBS that 50 percent of Europe's record inflation comes from surging energy costs. On the other hand, she said the Fed's battle in the U.S. has been made more difficult by the tight labor market. And of course, we'll continue to discuss the different dynamics on either side of the Atlantic, Anna, with our guests on this program.
Absolutely. A lot to discuss then coming up next. Frederick Roland, investment strategist to Pictet Asset Management. What impact, if any, does he see from the French election, the broader uh, stories around European leadership and European politics? Or is it all about China and Chinese growth for him right now? We'll talk to Frederick shortly. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. We've got a risk-off mood in the markets. Emmanuel Macron's re-election in France removed one area of market concern, but the threat of more lockdowns in China has stocks tumbling. It's the highest level U.S. visit to Ukraine since Russia's invasion. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin met with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky in Kyiv late on Sunday night and promised more military aid. And Bloomberg's learned that Elon Musk met with Twitter executives on Sunday about his takeover offer. The company is said to be turning more receptive toward the $43 billion bid. Musk's offer includes backing from Morgan Stanley and other financial institutions. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Matt, the focus for markets this morning seems to be firmly on growth concerns. Last week was all about inflation. Today we pivot and focus instead on Chinese growth. That's right. Last week was all about how much is the Fed going to hike? And this week, um, or at least today, it's like, who cares, right? We're looking at real growth concerns driving the S&P futures down after um, uh, an almost 3% loss in the cash trade on Friday. Investors are buying up 10-year debt, even if they think um, supposedly that there's going to be like 450 basis point hikes in a row. Um, they're buying 10-year debt now, and that pushes the yield down to 282.75. We were looking at 297 at one point on Friday. NYMEX crude, this is where you see the growth concerns, the possible drop in demand off 5% to 97.39 a barrel for Texas Intermediate and Bitcoin also down almost 3%, $38,390 a pop. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of pre-market movers? Well, of course, Anna mentioned the Twitter story. Reportedly, Elon Musk meeting with executives from the company over the weekend. Are they getting warmer to the idea of his uh, bid for the company? Right now, the stock is up about three-tenths of a percent in early hours. But while that tech stock is moving higher, most of them are moving lower on the day today with NASDAQ 100 futures lower. And that is true, too, for Chinese technology stocks listed here in the U.S. The ADRs of Alibaba, for example, down about four percent, of course, following on from the losses we saw in China over overnight. Then, of course, Matt, you were talking about the declines we're seeing in oil. It's really declines across the commodities complex, and that is feeding right through to commodity tied equities, including energy stocks like ExxonMobil down about 3%, as well as those related to the metals. Uh, U.S. steel is down about 4.5% before the bell, Anna. So, Kaylee, this is a look at what we've got for European stocks then. The S&P futures off a percent. European stocks reflecting more links with the global economy, perhaps. And we see European equities really under pressure today, down by just over 2%. Catching up a little bit with Friday's moves on Wall Street, but also factoring in those growth concerns around China. And here are the growth concerns around China in the commodity space. And that weighs on basic resource stocks and on energy stocks here in Europe as well. So the Brent crude price down by 4.5%, 101 the handle there. The euro also being caught up in that risk aversion. Uh, so we're selling the euro, selling the pound, buying the dollar, selling the Chinese yuan, those themes dominating the FX markets. And Philips in here as a reminder that we have earnings season continuing and actually getting into full stride here in Europe this week. Uh, we've heard from Philips. They disappointed the market, and this is the way that that kind of stock is punished when it disappoints the market, it seems, in this context. Given the pricing pressures, yes, they're putting up prices, but they're also talking about the threats involved in higher costs still to come and inflation. They still foresee inflation in the years, not just months ahead. Let me show you what's going on on Russian assets. The big question really around Russian assets still at this point remains, will they, won't they, or to what extent will Europe come up with any kind of ban or block on any Russian commodities. Uh, there's a lot of talk about whether something around Russian oil will be crafted. Still a lack of clarity around that, but that is certainly something that is being cited as a reason we're seeing stocks weaker over in Moscow. Let us get back to Paris, though, as Emmanuel Macron defeats Marine Le Pen in France's presidential election on a pro-business, pro-EU platform. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix has been uh, covering the election in all, its, uh, in all of its uh, preceding rounds as well from Paris for us, and she joins us there uh, from Paris now and she's with Frederic Roland, investment strategist at Pictet Asset Management. Francine. 
Yeah, so much to talk about, and uh, the parliamentary elections coming up in France, whether Emmanuel Macron with that 58.5 percent of the vote yesterday can actually govern, but also what the hell's going on in the markets? What does it mean for a China lockdown, a longer term for inflation, the rest of the world, and commodities? So I'm delighted to be joined by Frédéric. So, like, maybe let's start on the, the global markets. Today are really freaking out because of these lockdowns in China. Could they not have predicted this two, three weeks ago? I mean, the direction of travel was there. What are they really worried about? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when you look at uh, the success of the lockdown, for example, in Hong Kong, one might think that maybe the Chinese government would not pursue this route because, you know, it's, it's not been fantastic. There is a very high cost for growth. So some, I think some investors would expect this policy to change. And obviously what we're seeing in Shanghai uh, today is that it doesn't change and that uh, probably Omicron now is spreading in other towns. So uh, the, zero, the zero COVID policy will be there for some time. And I think, yeah, it's not new news, but you know, some people would hope, you know, the contrary, I think. Yeah. Does it mean, though, that it's really European assets? Assets, and I want to ask you which ones that will suffer the most. First of all, the proximity to Russia, the proximity, of course, to that Russian oil, if there was to be an oil embargo because of the war in Ukraine, but also the dependence of Europe to China and therefore the impact of a lockdown. So impact of lockdown would be, you know, uh, detrimental to all companies that would be more linked to uh, China, to China consumer, uh, first thing. And a uh, second thing, you know, to companies that were more linked to growth. We know that we had a fantastic growth last year. It's going down, but you have revision even further. And maybe these companies that are too sensitive to growth would uh, could underperform in there. And finally, you know, those uh, companies who have small margins that are uh, squeezed by higher commodities prices could suffer as well. We were expecting some parts of the French market, the CAC 40, to move on the back of that re-election of Emmanuel Macron. I'm thinking of the banks, the energy stocks, the utilities that Marine Le Pen was also thinking of nationalizing. Was there not a Macron put on this, or is it, you know, China distracting? Yeah, I mean, uh, Macron uh, re-election was predicted at, uh, by the bookmakers, for example, if they count for about 95 percent. So we can say that it was, uh, you know, all, already in, in the market. There had been some volatility one week before uh, the first round when, you know, you had polls that were giving Macron a 51 to 52 chance to, to, to win. It was much, much tighter, but, you know, 58, it gave him, you know, he's still a president now. Uh, it was, you know, uh, polls were already 56 around, you know, a week before. And it gives him some margin to, uh, to win the legislative probably. Yeah. Uh, Frederic, good to see you. It's Anna here in London. Uh, sticking with some of the themes Francine was talking about there in terms of global investments and concerns around China, today's market just looks so different from last week, and I wonder which theme you're backing into the future. I mean, last week we were all worried about inflation and yields were going higher and central banks were sounding hawkish. Today we're all worried once again about global growth, and it seems it's been a while since that's been the case. Do you expect yields to continue last week's themes of moving higher from here? No, no, not, not that sure. I think the, the, the levels of, of the markets now of the U.S. bonds are, are, are quite high in terms of rates. Uh, I think the Fed's been expressing itself quite, uh, quite widely, and the hawks have you know, you know, taken control. So I'm not sure today that we have more uh, on that side. And the news now are more on growth, uh, growth in China, which is uh, uh, today already pressuring the, the, the commodities. And you can see as well some uh, uh, um, consumers uh, losing confidence with, you know, salaries going up, that, that's good. Having uh, employment, also that's good. But inflation uh, beating really uh, purchasing power. So for the moment, I think the focus uh, will turn from inflation to a slower global growth, as we've seen, for example, in the new revisions of, uh, of the IMF. And do you see evidence that we see demand destruction from higher commodity prices, Frederick? Is that, is that a theme that you're investing around? Have, have commodity prices risen too far? Well, I mean, uh, looking at, at France, for, I mean, at Europe, for example, you have a fairly high inflation, uh, uh, more than 5 percent. And uh, the, the data concerning salaries is uh, around a rise of 1.5 percent. We'll probably go higher, but still, you know, there is a loss there. So probably uh, consumers will be, will, will be hit. And we already we don't see that much today in, in retail sales, but we already see that in, in consumer confidence, which is very often uh, a leading indicator of, of retail sales. So, yeah.
yes, not, you know, not really in the hard data, a big way yet, but uh, the early indicators show that uh, there will be some demand destruction, you know, as well. Still, you know, probably not a recession for us because of the savings uh, that have been, you know, uh, 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 taken by the household uh, across the globe. You know, there is a lot of cash in the portfolio. There is a lot of savings. So maybe some kind of uh, uh, slower uh, retail sales, but not a recession for us. Frederick, thank you very much. Frederick Roland, investment strategist at Pictet Asset Management. Thank you very much. Thanks to Francine Lacroix for joining us uh, and uh, kicking off that conversation in Paris. Coming up on this program, the Bogle effects. Bloomberg's top ETF guru talks to Vanguard's founder and how he turned Wall Street inside out and saved investors trillions of dollars. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, Nancy Davis, CIO at Quadratic Capital Management. That's at 3.30 p.m. in New York, 8.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now, Vanguard's legendary founder, Jack Bogle, created one of the biggest financial innovations in history. And a new book out tomorrow called The Bogle Effect takes a deep dive into the massive impact that Bogle and Vanguard um, have had uh, on investors and will have on investors, portfolios, and the financial industry at large. Eric Balchunas, author of this book, joins us now. He is also a senior ETF analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence and one of my co-hosts on ETF IQ, which... Uh, broadcast every day, every Monday, I should say, at 1 p.m. <laughs> Great to have you in the studio. I'm super psyched uh, about this book because I had the privilege of interviewing Jack Bogle on a number of occasions when I was a kid, and um, <laughs> he is just an absolutely legendary figure. Very unique, I would say. Yeah, no, he's absolutely abnormal. He was on a different trip, um, and that's part of what I wanted to explore in this book. I felt that index funds and indexing gets way too much credit for the, quote, index fund revolution. It's really about Vanguard's mutual ownership structure, where it's customer-owned, the fund's owned, and then they basically vote every time they get profits to lower the fees. So over 50 years, the fees went from 45, 50 basis points down to three or four, mm. right? And so without that, index funds won't, wouldn't have been cheap, and they'd be in a, a niche product. Well, it's and how much money has he saved you know, American, really global investors. I was reminded of Bogle when we saw Elon Musk giving his TED Talk Q&A. He said, I, don't, I only care about free speech. I don't care about the economics, right? And everybody was like, yeah, right. You know, obviously he wants the money too. Yeah. Bogle didn't. I mean, he yeah. had, you know, I don't know how much, 70, 80, 100 million dollars, but he must have made billions for investors. Yeah, no, my calculation is he saved just about in the ballpark of a trillion as of today. But that number is going to grow by about 150 billion a year, and that number will grow every year. So we're looking at three or four trillion by the end of this decade. And he didn't cash in. He didn't cash in. I mean, it's just unbelievable that somebody would turn over the ownership of the company to the customers. That just never happens. That's what makes him different than a Jeff Bezos or a Bill Gates, right? They all became billionaires. He didn't. And that's part of what I wanted to explore was how come nobody's copied Vanguard's structure because they had so much success and nobody has. And the answer is obviously, well, there's no economic incentive. <laughs> no, nobody wants to drive a Volvo like he did. Yeah. Mm. Well, then my, my next question was... <laughs> why, why? <laughs> so greed is a factor, is yeah. what you're my saying. Wife. So my next question to the 50 people interviewed, well, then why did this guy do it? Everybody's answer was the same. That's a good question. So I had a whole chapter I explore called Explaining Bogle, where I try to explain the ingredients that would go into a person mm. that would do this. Now, mm -hmm. he wasn't totally altruistic. Vanguard was partially a creation of a nasty bifurcation with his old partners at Wellington and a way to sort of get back at them. But once he locked into this idea that, oh, we have a, we have a structure that's going to lower fees over time, he became somewhat of an evangelist. So, my again, my thesis okay. is that the mutual ownership structure and Bogle structure were the real explosion that is rippling out today. Index funds merely a byproduct of that, but Vanguard's moving into other areas, wealth management, ETFs, international. Mm -hmm. 
It sounds like a fascinating book, Eric. We don't want to give away too much about it in this conversation, although Matt's trying his best to. You mentioned ETFs, so let's talk about ETFs uh, today because uh, you were flagging a story, or I think you know your, your team putting together this story about long-term treasury ETFs, such as iShares 20, uh, 20 plus year treasury bond ETF, where money is going in, even at a time when, well, maybe that wouldn't be your first instinct to assume that would be happening when people have been selling bonds. Yeah, TLT is a bit of an anomaly this year. Uh, people are just piling in. Look, every, everywhere, there, there's always an ETF somebody's buying the dip on. And, you know, last year it was KWeb. This year it's TLT. Um, I think they're going to get burned, I personally, but they're looking to try to cash in. I guess they, people are trying to pick somewhere, anywhere in the bond market, that could pop the most if there's some kind of a rebound. And they think TLT, long dated, is the place to do it. But overall, if you take a bigger, wider view, uh, bond funds are really in the gutter. And if you look at bond mutual funds, they're now at $112 billion in outflows for the year, which is a ton of money. That is, uh, if you take that, that's more than any year they've seen uh, on record since we began tracking this back in 2006. And that is going to create a constant selling pressure on bonds. So there will be people trying to find maybe some dip opportunities. But overall, there's just this big suppressed feeling of outflows and negativity towards bonds. OK, finally, I, I want to ask about a crypto ETF as well, because you have Bitcoin ETFs starting to debut in Australia in the coming days. No spot ETF still here in the United States. You got the futures one, no spot. What is your assessment on if and when that might actually happen? Yeah, we think summer 2023. Uh, sort of like maybe the, the new Top Gun movie <laughs> coming summer, summer, summer 2023. The reason why is because we feel like the SEC is going to need to have some framework on the exchanges, some regulation. Gensler wants control, right? And we also think he wants a promotion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he wants to show that he is regulating crypto. The way to do that is to expand the definition of the word exchange. Yeah. If he does that, which we, the proposal is out to do it, we think, you know, because the government doesn't move that fast, that happens over the next year. Once that happens and he can have control over the exchanges, we think a spot Bitcoin ETF will, will come soon, even quickly after that. So it's a ballpark figure, but that's generally our thesis. Some people differ, but we think we have a pretty strong view on this, and we were right about the futures ETF. We nailed that call, and so this is our call for the spot. All right. I just want to reassure any viewers <laughs> whose heart stopped, because mine did for a minute, <laughs> Um, the new Top Gun movie is still out, due for release May 27th. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, so oh, not good. summer oh. 2023. It keeps, it keeps getting pushed back. Yeah, it was sure James never Bond that took like You were freaking me out for a second. That movie is the spot Bitcoin ETF of movies. <laughs> well, I, I hope they don't push it out again. Eric, thanks very much. Eric Balchunas there at Bloomberg Intelligence. We'll see you later on. Of course, you'll be joining Kaylee and myself for the ETF show at 1 p.m. today. The new book, The Bogle Effect, is out tomorrow. Um, we'll talk more about it on ETF IQ. Again, that's every Monday at 1 p.m. New York time. You can watch it on Bloomberg.com as well. Um, you can also watch Bloomberg Crypto. That's tomorrow and every Tuesday <laughs> at 1 p.m. New York time. By the way, uh, a little bit of a plug. Shanali Basic had a great interview with the Mooch, with Scaramucci mm -hmm. on his uh, focus towards crypto. So maybe that'll last a little bit longer than 11 days. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines in New York and Anna Edwards in London. We are now joined by Tom Keene, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom, what is your single best chart of this Monday morning? Got to be on the equity markets, Matt. They're really in retreat. Dow futures negative 260. The VIX out to a 30. Let's look at the VIX uh, right now. And it tells a picture of the pandemic with a huge shock that we saw in early 2020. Down we go, getting back to where we were 10 years ago. 15 years ago, lower number, a better market. And once again, man, I sort of did an account, but it's too Monday morning. Who wants to count? I think we're like six <laughs> times through 30 right now. We are again a 30 VIX. It is not even 6 a.m. and you're counting in New York, Tom. Yeah. Uh, I know you're counting I'm great counting guests. in French elections. Coming up uh, on Bloomberg Surveillance. Who have you got? Uh, 
On the show today, we have John Farrow and Lisa Bramowitz. That's who we have uh, today. No, seriously, we're, we're adjusting the market. Sobrato Rajapa joins us as well. We start strong. Must watch for Global Wall Street. Jens Nordvig will get us started, and a lot of that on dollar strength here. Not out to a 102 on DXY, but that would be a big deal. All right, Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Looking forward to the coverage over the next three hours. Thank you so much. Now, much like Tom Keen, I am also watching the markets today. He mentioned the dollar. It's at the strongest since May of 2020, but you're really seeing the ripple effects of China growth concerns across asset classes, Matt. You have futures that are lower. It actually is NASDAQ 100 futures holding up a little bit better, still down, but not as much as S&P 500. Uh, they're off about seven tenths of 1% because you are seeing that massive bid coming in to the perceived haven of the U.S. Treasury market down about seven basis points on the 10-year yield, 282. And oil taking it on the chin, 4.5% yeah. decline on WTI. We're at $97 a barrel, Matt. Yeah, that, wait, first of all, Surik, why don't you take us wide? We're sitting right next to each other. <laughs> For and reference, I'll, Matt because is speaking I need, to the director. Because then would, I can't fit in the middle. <laughs> I, well, no, I just, it's so rare that Kaylee and I are allowed to sit next to each other. And I, I'm watching the markets as well. Yeah. You know, I think um, Anna nailed it when she said at the top of the show, the focus has shifted. We were all freaked out about how many times the Fed was going to hike rates. Yeah. Fittingly, uh, we had we heard from Kathy Wood over the weekend. She said they're not going to hike rates that much. Mm -hmm. Today, we're worried about China and growth, and that's why you see the drop in demand um, for everything but palm oil, right, <laughs> Anna? Because you're watching palm oil. Are you watching palm oil? Is that what you're watching today? <laughs> no, I'm watching European bank earnings, but really, it's a sort of week ahead theme. Uh, but but what you've just been talking about is all going to be really crucial when, when it comes mm -hmm. to the European bank earnings story. We're going to be thinking about how quickly interest rates go up or don't because you know how quickly does that focus on inflation rub up against our concerns around growth and that to your point Matt has become the dominant theme and we were we were talking to our guest in in Paris earlier on and we thought we were going to spend the time talking about the impact of the French election but actually there hasn't been so much impact on markets because it went the way that the that, the, that everybody assumed that it would go Matt and yet so, so today we find ourselves with a different Guess dilemma, which is that. back to, back to, which is back to inflation versus growth, which seems to be much yeah, ado you know, about theme nothing. From weeks and months uh, ago, but it was worth it because we got to see Francine on a rooftop in front of the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, true. Well, there you go. And the euro, the euro is where is the euro now? Down uh, around a half a percent. So on a day where we thought the euro would get some support, we didn't see that come to pass. But plenty of other market themes generated by China to focus on, and no doubt. Uh, surveillance will continue to do that. That is it for the uh, early edition of Surveillance. Uh, we'll be watching out for the, ba for the bank earnings season here in Europe as the week progresses. Lots of other earnings stories uh, still to come, though. The tech earnings story over in the United States will certainly be a big theme for us as this week goes on. This is Bloomberg.